Hello, this is Carol Smaldino and welcome to The Human Climate. My guest today is Mark Vonnegut, pediatrician and author of the book, The Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics, published uh, conveniently right now in February, 2022. Welcome, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I've been as patient as I could be, so I'm glad we're doing this. And um, as I was kind of preparing, I was thinking of the ways I know you or know of you. And I think that the first way was through the book, um, just like a person without mental illness, only more so. And that really spoke to me. Uh, you spoke about your own mental breakdowns and I don't know, you had a certain kind of humor as well. Uh, irony, wryness that um, was helpful. And I found myself kind of riveted and connected because, you know, you say, I think you say on page 21 of your new book, The Heart of Caring, uh, you say, how can you be a doctor and not care too much? And you talk about psychosis as in part coming from that. And I connect with that because I feel the same way about being a social worker and a psychotherapist. You know, how can you do that without caring too much? And in fact, I, I um, have a fair amount of envy in my uh, repertoire. And I sometimes have envied people who are mentally ill and they have a set diagnosis and I feel they have a place to go when they fall apart and they have the medication that seems to work okay. And I don't have the time or the money, but I've had this idea of a sanity spa that would be paid for by the way, by hmm. insurance, which we'll get to later. And it would be for the people who are not necessarily mentally ill the way we think of it, but mentally kind of broken or falling apart or um, in a wretched place and who need to come together in a better way and not necessarily a normal way. Um, one of the things you talk about, which I found very helpful, is kind of the myth of mental wellness. And one of the things you say in just like a person without mental illness, you say that we like to call people bipolar and schizophrenic so we can have the illusion of being well. And that, you know, being well is a myth. So, um, so I wanna talk about everything, but there isn't gonna be the time. I wanna talk about Haiti, I wanna talk about health insurance and the lack thereof, and the terrible state of affairs of the medical situation in our country. And uh, I wanna talk about your father because you can't say Vonnegut. Obviously it's not a very common name. You can't say Vonnegut without Somebody saying, is that a relation to Kurt? And, you know, you say that Kurt Vonnegut, your father, was a gateway drug to reading. And I think that's true for many. I mean, I read him in college and I'm going back to reading him. I think that's because of you, but that's because of the connection I have felt in reading your stuff, I, I want to go back to reading him. And um, one of the things you helped me do is kind of de-idealize him some. Mm -hmm. I think you know, the fact that you talk about him as um, seeming like a younger brother to you is very telling. And so you convey his mischief and his quirkiness and his kind of difficultness, I don't think that's a word, but but I, I wanted to ask you about his having a heart because 
I found myself very moved again because I reread all your stuff again for today when you spoke about his sister and his brother's death and his, and I guess your mom's taking in the orphans. So I haven't let you talk at all, but could you say something about that episode in your life? Like when that happened? Um, yeah, it was, it, it was something that transformed uh, my family and my life. Uh, and we suddenly uh, were um, known as the family that took in four kids. And uh, my mother, essentially, she was still my mother, but she was really much more Aunt Jane. And um, it, it was it was certainly odd. I, I felt that their story uh, was really dramatic and it was my job to sort of make life easier for them, which they didn't need at all. The, the cousin closest to me in age uh, was, you know, captain of three sports, most, you know, most popular president of the class, uh, several inches taller than me, uh, blonde and blue eyed. So what can you do? <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it was, it, it sort of became everything about our family. And um, it was very puzzling to me. Um, and, um, you know, I felt like a footnote to this drama where my aunt and uncle died. And uh, for uh, orphans were created. Um, so, um, yeah, Can that. You see how that happened, or it, it, I mean, do you want me, just me to say it? Because it's like the 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 story of how how my aunt and uncle died. Yeah. Oh, again, it was like um, it was it was the sort of thing you could put into a novel and nobody would believe it. Um, my uh, aunt had, um, had cancer. She was not told about it. And this was, I guess, in 1958. Uh, oh. And she was dying. And I think on some level she knew that, but nobody was talking to her um, about the fact that she had cancer. Um, and uh, her husband was supposed to go to work and he actually got a later train than he usually got. And this is, I think, was the only train that ever went off an open drawbridge uh, into Newark, Newark Bay. Um, and it wasn't, he wasn't found for uh, several weeks. And so there was this, um, knowing on the part of my parents that these were these chills, children were probably orphaned. And uh, I think my father got in a car and went down to New Jersey and came back with uh, four boys, two dogs uh, and a rabbit. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and that was, you know, I was sort of, I, I, I was and am sort of an introvert and all of a sudden there was all this, you know, attention. Um, and it was kind of puzzling to me. I suddenly uh, sort of, I tried to learn about sports. Uh, I actually went out for some sports. I tried to learn the rules of football. And stuff. I, I was... Um, so I was trying to fit in, um, to, uh, the normal, being a normal kid in sixth, seventh and eighth grade. Um, but prior to that, I had been, uh, I had been a kid who was, who was good at chess, uh, not a bit terribly, uh, popular activity, uh, among my peers. And I went fishing and spent a lot of time in the woods and, on the marsh. So I went from being um, a loner to somebody who was trying to catch up uh, with Steve and my other cousins and watching them and trying to see how this uh, 
socialization thing worked. And uh, I was, I, I, I did okay. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you become a hippie? Um, as as soon as it was possible, <laughs> you know, it was um, it was um, clear to me um, that the war in Vietnam was profoundly wrong, and it showed that our country was pro was profoundly um, in error and. Um, and we were, and so my hair got longer and longer and I went to more and more demonstrations and uh, it just, it just seemed like um, the moral and ethical thing to do, to, um, to not want to be part of the economy that was supporting a war. Um, so um, it, it seemed like it didn't seem unusual at all. It seemed like a natural path uh, and a morally correct path. So you formed a, I mean, I mean, not just you, but you formed a commune. Yes. Yeah, myself and uh, I decided definitely, I didn't know what to do uh, exactly. I certainly didn't want to go to graduate school or get a job. So I got this idea of I would go out to British Columbia um, and start a commune. And the amazing thing is that, that it worked, uh, that uh, actually found 80 acres uh, remote. Uh, there was no electricity, no roads. We were 12 miles from the nearest electric light. And, uh, and we, you know, we, we built a house, we built a home, we learned how to, uh, um, to live that way. It was, it was, um, I found it very congenial to be so far away from civilization. And I felt like I was, uh, I felt like the economy and uh, uh, and our country was falling apart, and I was creating a safe place uh, for my relatives and friends and to come live on a self-sufficient farm when it became necessary. And in the Eden Express, which I also read, I think you talk about a breakdown that came in that period, or yeah. was it after that period? It was right in the middle of that period, and it really um, it wrecked. <laughs> I was, you know, I was I was pretty much the spark plug of that operation, and the fact that uh, I became incapacitated uh, and psychotic um, really, you know, challenged a lot of things ab ab about the what we were doing. Um, and, um, you know, change things profoundly. Um, Cause they did not, I didn't know what mental illness was. I think we all believed in R.D. Lang that, that uh, insanity was a reasonable reaction to an insane society. And here we were, uh, you know, way, way far away from our society. And I had become sick in that way. And um, they tried to take me to a guru. They tried to keep me out of the hospital. And it just challenged everything we knew and thought about mental illness. It was, and which is to um, challenge everything you think about, about life. Right. You know, you say um, at one point, I think you say, in um, just like a person without mental illness, only more so, I got the title. Um, uh, I think it's a great title and I'm really glad they let you have it, keep it. Um, you say when you had the breakdown where you thought you could fly, you were convinced you could fly and they took you in a straitjacket to Mass General where you worked and you had to talk to nurses that you knew um, as you were going through the hall and you, you remark, I think, couldn't they at least have taken me to McLean? 
<laughs> and I, I mean, it seems like you had this thought, even though it wasn't so classy to have a breakdown, that it would be kind of a class act to go there. And it seems like you managed to go there a few years ago. Yeah, yes, I find it's a horrible hospital. Uh, the care there is horrible. Um, but it, it just felt ironic to me that as a member of the faculty uh, who, you know, a week before was teaching interns and medical students how to treat seizures, um, you know, here I was in boxer shorts and four point restraints, uh, people whose children I took care of were walking by and I was reassuring them, don't worry, this will all be okay. Um, and I was, I, you know, I think care for mental illness has been a pretty much downward, um, straight downward path. The first hospitalization I was, it took about four months, cost eleven thousand uh, dollars, and I was given a lot of attention. Attention, and uh, then you stayed in a hospital, not the two weeks that the insurance would cover, but you stayed in a hospital until the doctors thought you were okay to go home. Right. Uh, and people think of snake pits and all that. I. The psychiatric hospitals were not like that, and uh, and they have um, become places where the minute you go, they uh, they start planning how to send you home. Right. They over medicate, and um, you know the care I got in British Columbia uh, was much better than the care I got um, in Harvard hospitals. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's, you know, it's made you very humble because I think that you stop thinking this will never happen again. I mean, you know, you say a couple of times, I pray to God this will never happen again, but you don't really know. That's the problem. Uh, I mean, you said earlier that it would be comforting to have a diagnosis. Um, the problem is the diagnoses change. And I started as a schizophrenic. Then I was a paranoid schizophrenic with a lousy prognosis. Then I was promoted to a schizophrenic who might respond to lithium. And then I was, then I became manic depressive. And then they took me off lithium at medical school um, because my thyroid was, was enlarged. And, uh, then I be, I said, well, what was that? And they said it was a severe adolescent adjustment, uh, uh, reaction, which, so, you know, having had so many diagnoses and then, uh, when they stopped the lithium, um, I, without knowing what I was doing, started self-medicating myself with alcohol and sleeping pills. Um, and that's, that's more or less what they told me was okay. And, and then it wasn't okay. And when I stopped all that is when I had the uh, breakdown that landed me in the hospital with four point restraints and uh, the emergency room where I worked. And, um, so it's just, it, you know, what happens to you is what happens to you, but the names they put on it are not particularly useful. Yeah. You know, I, 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 you haven't said anything about this, but they're doing a lot of research now on psychedelics. You know, they're bringing back what has, has been prohibited really in part by the Nixon administration. I mean, a long time ago, um, when I think people were very scared of psychedelics being widespread and people who took them not wanting to be co-opted by the economic society or the political society or the middle, you know, the military. But do, do you have, have you read about that or you have any thoughts about that? The yeah, um, I, I think, 
the powers that be, the ruling class or whatever, um, were so terrified of the alternative lifestyles that they they started pathologizing it very early. Uh, I would say it certainly was not all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah. Part of me wishes that it had been. <laughs> it would have been more fun. But um, And I'm quite sure that the hippies never spit on the troops. This was, Again, these were lots of, uh, of uh, you know, pathologizing. And it still goes... You know, it still goes on. People, you know, talk about we're not sitting around a fire saying kumbaya. Um, I think people were terrified that there was possibly an alternative way of looking at things that would once again uh, make uh, the war, racism, poverty, um, and all that was getting challenged. And all of that was really... Um, a necessary part of the machine, and uh, and that's what was getting challenged. Well, now they have you know psilocybin assisted therapy clinics, mm -hmm. and you know I th think it's going to be interesting if they give that to the general population as well. You know, I think it could change things. Yep, but um. I want to ask you about um, the heart of caring. I keep thinking I'm going to make a mistake and say the caring heart, but it, it <laughs> seems like they're, you know, they're intertwined. I mean, they go together, you know. Um, and, you know, the fact that you have had this career that you love and that you seem to love the kids that you work with and the families that you work with and the fact that you can listen to these people and you can make a difference. And, you know, it's very striking that you, um, you know, I think of learning from my kids, you know, to be a parent or learning from my patients or my clients to be a therapist. You know, they tell me very often what they need. I mean, sometimes I have to fight with people. I mean, I have to be willing to have an argument, but it's, it is very powerful to be in a position of listening to people. And I think you, can you say something about that? Because you seem so passionate. And it, I, you know, a lot of it came out of my own experience. Um, it was, I mean, the second book is really, uh, a way of talking about mental illness, among other things, trying to uh, say you can be mentally, you can have mental illness and a history of mental illness, and you can recover, uh, you can live without stigma, you can have a profession, you can have a family. And I think uh, a lot of people um, think of mental illness as a deal breaker that you can't, you, you can't have a life. Um, if you have something like bipolar disease and I wanted, you know, very much, and that's why it's just like someone without mental illness only more so is just to say, yes, mental illness is very, very real, but you can recover. I would never say recovering is easy as the hardest thing, uh, I have ever done in my life is recover from from the from the illnesses that I've had, the episodes that I've had. Why do you think recovering is so hard? Because you are exhausted. Um, I think there is a natural depression which follows a uh, manic break. And it just, you know, I tried to go back to work after the last one and I just couldn't do it. I was just you know, it was just too tired. Nothing was, it, it was a depression. Um, and it was, was very depressing for me to, to say, I can't do my work. I maybe can't ever do my work again. But I, you know, I do every 
healthy thing I can think of in terms of, uh, you know, um, no alcohol, no drugs. I do yoga. I, I work out. I, you know, I did everything that might have helped me. Um, and uh, and I slowly I got stronger. I had a wonderful therapist, by the way, who I woke, you know, I, I when I met her, I felt very broken. And she said one thing to me, um, which was, you're not done. You know, and it made me, you know, I was at the time I, I was, I was like 70 years old. Uh, and I felt like my life was over. And just having a therapist um, who said, you're not done. I have the feeling you're not done. And she was right. I was not done. And I'm not done now. <laughs> you know, so. Well, that's good. Yeah. And that was really the point of the second book. Is yeah. that, you know, life is good. Uh, regardless, uh, if you have a if you have a psychiatric diagnosis or you don't. Yeah, I, I think what you say at one point too is that it's important that you not dwell endlessly on the let's say the economic situation that we're in, and um, but you're very passionate about it. I mean. Um, uh, I, uh, I do a lowbrow thing of, um, watching law and order when I do my exercise bike at home and every once in a while, especially 2020, 2021, you know, the episodes are, some of them are really good. And they had just an episode before, you know, we did this, uh, on big pharma and opioids and, trading sex for uh, getting uh, business, you know, getting contracts. And I mean, I wouldn't pass, you know, put it past anybody, but it's like the amount of not caring and the quality of greed is very, very scary. And, you know, you talk about trying to oppose this and, you know, my work has led me to the importance of the shadow and the importance of getting in touch with all the parts of ourselves. So whether it's crazy or not crazy, but we all have the capacity to be terrible, just yeah. like we all have the capacity to be wonderful. And um, I think when we can empathize with all the parts of ourselves, we don't have to demonize. And then we don't have to put people on a pedestal and then we can care more you know we can let go of the detachment which is also addictive i think because you know the people who are so greedy they seem i really have begun to feel that it's an addiction and you know the thinking just of today just of this minute of like winning the bet winning the deal um gambling yeah. that it's you know I and I I mean it's hard because it, it feels helpless for you know those of us who care yes and it's I mean frankly let's be honest about it uh, when you uh, make insulin unaffordable when you push opiates whatever you are killing people. I mean, there's nothing, there's no other way to look at it. And I don't think that there's any way that the people who are doing these things, uh, most of whom are making $20 million a year or up, um, how, how can they do that? I mean, they, and I think for myself and in terms of recovery, and one of the things I'm grateful um, to my illness for is uh, the value and the power of service, of being of service to other people, rather than uh, what these guys are doing is they are holding sick and poor people over a barrel and extracting money from them. You know, and it's, it is, um, it's astounding to me that human beings can behave that way, but I know that they do. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder, I mean, it's something I, I, I want to give some thought to because I know that the people in power have an incredible, it's like an illness of detachment, except mm -hmm. we in the society, I mean, most people don't see it as an illness. They see it as exciting, like the excitement of living in a celebrity culture and living vicariously and comparing ourselves endlessly. So I think I've started to think that it's not just attachment, but it's real addiction to the excitement of, you know, winning and that nothing else matters, um, which is really scary. But I guess if that's true, I mean, I don't know if it's true. It's just a thought that I'm having. But if it is true and enough of us started to look at that, you know, the illness of the people who don't care, that's, I mean, detachment is a form of illness. It's not being present. It's not really being alive. I mean, you know, it takes a kind of deadness really not to care because the other side of the caring heart and the heart of caring is what happens when people don't care. And I think the heart of caring is, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful set of gifts. And it sort of, to me, implies what happens when it isn't there. And, um, and that, I think, um, you know, one of the, <laughs> I'll just use the word evil, but one of the evil things that is happening is that medical care is uh, becoming turning doctors uh, into an assembly line. Um, and uh, over half of medical care now, um, you're, you're seen by a doctor who uh, will never see you again and hasn't seen you before and has no investment in a healing relationship. And I say, you know, I think uh, without uh, a relationship there's no healing and without healing there's no relationship so i think it ha has to be there has to be connection uh and connection is what is missing and if you're coming down an assembly line and somebody looks in your ear and says you have an ear infection here's your amoxicillin in a sense to uh, limit uh, medical care to something like that is evil and yeah. it's a missed opportunity. And I think uh, caring is an opportunity uh, to help yourself and to help other people get better. Um, yeah, I, th I think you mentioned that it, it makes sense for a lot of people to doubt the medical profession and the scientific community and the pharmaceutical community, which is like, I think part of what's going on in the polarization about vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I'm boosted, I'm, I'm surrounded by medical people. I'm, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have the wherewithal to even begin to think of not doing the, the right thing, so to speak according to the medical community. But I think I can begin to understand the lack of confidence that some people have, you know, because you see, if you've been ill, I mean, I haven't been in a mental institution, but I have had treatment for cancer. And I, in the middle of it, I kind of thought, did there's something wrong here. There is something wrong here where you have cancer hospitals and now people are having parties and pink ribbons are, you know, it's like, you know, you go into offices and it's pink ribbons and I don't, I don't really want to see that. I want to see the team of people who are trying to get rid of this. And when I see that I'm suspicious because when I see the bills that I'm not paying for, 
but someone's paying for, for treatments that are, you know, seem like from the Middle Ages, um, that you have to wear ice gloves and ice slippers and you're, you know, and all this harm can come to you. I think, you know, like if money is driving all of this, I don't know where it stops. So <laughs> exactly right. And money is driving all of this and money is driving the fact that we've lost 40% of our hospitals and 80% of our independent physicians and money is is driving this and 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 there's no other way really to look at it when you are trying to watch uh law and order or whatever <laughs> all of those ads that come up you can just go to google and you will find that each one of those medications costs at least fifty thousand uh, dollars a year and they're not available to most people uh, you know yeah. i have close friends who have died of hepatitis C, completely curable disease. I mean, that is terrible, but like a medication, like a bipolar medication that I know has helped people. I have known that's Latuda. It's not available in, in certain insurances. Right. So it's, it's a really unfair deprivation. Um, ab ab absolutely. And, and they say, well, the, <laughs> there are some of these words like evidence-based, whatever, as, as if doctors before were, you know, reading goat entrails or something. Um, but, that, but then, okay, we have treatments that work for autistic kids, and that's evidence-based. And the insurer all of a sudden says, oh, no, 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 you're, that, your plan doesn't cover that, or there's a deductible or whatever. So... Um, they pretend it's about science and, uh, and they're lying, they're just flat out lying. I, I kind of want to get towards an ending talking about your practice. And for some reason, I can't think of the content right now, but I think of Adeline and I wrote about her. I mean, I, I made some notes about it, but could you tell us about Adeline? Yeah, she was a girl uh, born with trisomy 13, uh, usual life expectancy. They die in the first year of life by, uh, uh, with congenital heart disease. Um, and I, you know, watch sort of the argument. They don't, there's no exit for their, for their waist. So they need a colostomy if they're going to survive. And they, the question at every point was, do we do this? Do we remove her cataracts? Do we give her hearing aids? Do we, um, and um, I would say every time I was, I, I was wrong. I, you know, I said, yeah, we should, we have to do the colostomy if she's just gonna be so un, un, unhappy. But the important thing to me was to let the patient, the parents know that they were the parents and they should be in charge. And I think what's happened over the last 40 years is what patients needed and what their symptoms were was the most important thing. And doctors served patients and then hospitals served doctors or we wouldn't send them the patients. And insurance was just there to pay for the care. There was, there was no idea, um, there, there was, you know, the idea that insurance would dictate care was ridiculous, you know. Um, so, I mean, Adeline was, uh, and she was sort of in a transition where, um, in the beginning, it was just the doctors figuring out what do we do for this child and supporting, um, the parents. And, uh, by the end, it was all prior authorizations and, uh, and, 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 and all of those things skyrocket the cost of medical care and they decrease, as you, you noticed, uh, the quality of care goes down, the cost goes up. And um, that's sort of, it's just math, you know, it's just math. 
It has no connection to the patient, uh, no intention to make things better. It's just math. So what happened to her? She died at the age of 23, which I, which is a, the, the longest anybody knows of anybody with trisomy 13 surviving. Um, and it was, again, she started getting these unexplained pneumonias. And it was like, um, you know, the parents and I said, you know, at some point we have to let Adeline go. Um, but it was, you know, there would be a pneumonia and a crisis and we'd say, okay, we'll treat it. But then we reached a point where we said, we have to let her go because she was just getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And rather than sort of letting her, um, you know, letting the disease of a pneumonia, uh, you know, with essentially suffocating, uh, you, you know, uh, we just, you know, we, with, we withdrew uh, care and, and gave her narcotics, which was the right thing to do. So I have one last question for you, if I can kind of sneak it in, because your father was an iconic, fascinating human being. And I, I just want to say, because I found it very interesting that you grew up, if that's okay, if I'm wrong, you know, please correct me, but that you kind of grew up with him struggling and being a used car salesman, Saab, I believe. Yes. Um, and then when you were about 21, he wrote Slaughterhouse Five mm -hmm. and became a sensation. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I think that was probably glorious for him, but in some ways he felt, um, what's the word? I, well, I, I think, uh, um, <clears throat> Achieving fame, just like achieving these salaries of it was, you know, seventy-three billion dollars, whatever the numbers are, um, it's very, very difficult for a human to survive a catastrophe. I, I see it as a catastrophe. From my point, I mean, I was out of the house and supporting myself and uh, getting ready to go to the commune, and um, and I just look around and say. Where'd all these rich people come from? You know, <laughs> why is my family suddenly, you know, traveling to Europe? Why, um, um, you know, where are all these nice cars coming? You know, and and to me, it was just like um, it was like a denial of our former life. Um, and I think uh, I think I think fame was horrible for him. I think it was horrible for um, for the rest of the family. Oh, that's interesting and important, I think, because I, I think it's, it's a catastrophe for many famous people, but for those of us who are not famous, you know, we tend to put that on a pedestal, all those pedestals. Yeah. You know, I, I, I once worked with a, a person who, um, who was put on a pedestal mm -hmm. as a kid and he, was from India and so he was very special as a boy and his mother put him on a pedestal in particular and he he became an alcoholic and he went to rehab and he came back and he said, you know, you were right that being put on a pedestal is a kind of abusive thing because when you fall, there's nothing there and there's nobody there. So it was kind of interesting but just to end on a, a personal advice as a reader, as, as wanting to go to, to that kind of gateway without putting it on a pedestal, I um, have on my shelf Cat's Cradle as, you know, I've read it before, but if one would want to go back to your father's writings, do you have any recommendation about what would be a good gateway? I, you know, he is, I mean, he's a marvelous writer. Um, I, I like Sirens of Titan. Um, Say that again, Sirens of Titan. Sirens of Titan um, I, it is my favorite, at least partly because um, 
you know, as a 10 or 11 year old or whatever, I, I help proofread. <laughs> so I feel That's so beautiful. I know. And I found a, uh, there was a, something where there was not an end quotation mark. And I was thrilled to be able to. Anyway, I think that that's I think that that's the most beautiful uh, book that has the characters somewhat fleshed out. I think his characters, otherwise, especially women, are uh, they're they're like cartoons. They're they're flat. They don't they don't they don't breathe. Um, so um, yeah, he's a wonderful wonderful writer. Um, and um, but at the end, he had all these people who would say that they were Kurt Vonnegut's best friend, that they had had a drink with Kurt Vonnegut. There was this and that, but there was, there was no true connection. There was a whole bunch of people who thought they were his best friend. That's sad. He, mm -hmm. he seemed to really respect you. I mean, to like you. Mm -hmm. you I, I, I think he did most of the time, but there was, uh, he, you know, he um, didn't really feel uh, attracted in any way, shape, or form to the to the role of being a father. You know, and he, um, he would as much as say, "Let me off the father hook." Like and that was okay, but it's an it's a, uh, it's a scary thing to have a father who doesn't want to be, uh, you know, a father. And I think that's part of the PTSD of what he went through in the war. Um, and uh, so he was, I think, for the cousins uh, and for his biologic children, um, he was a very mixed bag. Well, yeah, I get it. I mean, again, off the pedestal you go, mm -hmm. but um, you seem to... Uh, have loved being a father. Absolutely. That's and a, beautiful. And a soccer yeah. coach. I mean, I've, I've, I've done all sorts of things uh, that he didn't get to do. And that I think partly because of his fame or whatever, uh, he wouldn't let himself do. I mean, I don't think as a soccer coach, he would have let himself lose a game. I lost a lot of games. <laughs> Well, you also, I think as a doctor, you talk about embracing loss and embracing being wrong, embracing learning, you right. know? So I, I think that you seem to have enjoyed that. Right. And he had a certain bitterness, uh, uh, an endless hunger to say, you know, uh, am I as well known as Jack Kerouac? Am I as good as Fitzgerald? Am I as good as Hemingway? And at a certain point, um, I, you know, I said, uh, you know, why don't we go to Abraham Lincoln? Why don't we go, you know, why don't we go to Mark Twain? Why don't, you know, hell, let's yeah. go to Shakespeare. I mean, it's just, um, you know, it becomes uh, insatiable. The hunger of a yeah. person is insatiable. I mean, it's, it's its own illness, but it's, you know, it's not really diagnosed. I, I, I just read a biography of Philip Roth and he suffered the same thing. You know, my friend is being nominated for a Nobel and I'm not, and I won this and he didn't. And yeah, I mean, I, I you know, you make sense. So it's like, if all of us, if the rest of us could deal with our own illness of envy and jealousy and longing, that'd be good. Because, you know, fame is its own illness, as yeah. you say. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, having gotten to see it up close and personal, um, uh, you know, my sisters and I feel like we're, um, there's a certain, nobody else can possibly know, uh, you know, everybody else looks at him as, a, you know, a kindly uncle who said, God damn it, you have to be kind and all these wonderful things. And, uh, and we know it wasn't really there. Okay. Well, I, 
I think your role, I mean, you know, one of your roles is to not be on a pedestal, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's great that you've done what you've done and you're doing what you do. And, and thank you. I'm so glad I got you to do this. Or <laughs> I don't know if I got you to do this, but you agreed to do this. So it was really nice having you and thank you. Well, uh, thank you for having me. And I do think, I mean, if I have a message of any sort is I've been incredibly lucky to have had the life I've had. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that I wish more people felt lucky. Yeah. And you're not done. No, I'm not. I'm, as a therapist said, and I, I remind her of that. I said, you know, it was, you know, I'm publishing a book now. Thank you for telling me I wasn't done. Okay. Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is that funny? That's funny. Mark Vonnegut. Not Kurt Vonnegut. Mark Vonnegut. Dr. Mark Vonnegut. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to be here.